would look at someone and I would get feelings and see colors in my head and I a lot of the symbols and stuff would become metaphors for different things and it would only kind of be satiated if I would create the concept. And there was just this shadow in my field of vision that stepped out from around the corner and looked at me and I opened my eyes and immediately it was there was this clear knowing that I just knew what I'd done. <laughs> If you're in a journey situation or a vision and something gives you something, don't take it with you out of the session, uh, just for anyone doing that now. But I didn't know this at the time, so I did take this, but uh, they gave me a sword that had a very specific symbol carved onto it. And then they looked over at the being that was with me, acknowledged them and gave them a dagger with the same symbol. Hello everyone, I hope you're well. How are ye? Are ye good? It's episode 50 everybody. How about that? I am amazed and equally uh, quite smug and pleased with myself. Anyway, for episode 50, for this this special, special show, um, we are joined by the multi-talented Amana uh, Aelin. Um, and I, I really enjoyed this show, it was fantastic. Um, recording with, um, I, well, for all intents and purposes, my podcast twin, um, but it, it was a it was a it was a fun show for for a multitude of reasons which I'll get into. But um, Mana is is a shadow singer, an artist, an intuitive reader, an otherworldly traveler, a witch, a cemetery walker, um, hailing from the depths of the underworld. Mana often finds themselves connecting with wolfish creatures of this plane and others baneful plants and those who live in constant liminality. Mana also hosts The Real Witches of the End Times, a podcast on magic and paranormal folk sharing their stories and, and experiences and knowledge. Um, and it's a great podcast. I do encourage um, you guys to check it out. And it also has the best name in the, uh, I would say, occulture podcast circuit, which is... Um, which is something to definitely be proud of, I'm slightly jealous of as well. But anyway, we won't get into that. Um, so in this show, we got into the trials and tribulations of starting your own podcast, the experience of having an imaginary friend while a child, Mana discusses um, painting spirit portraits, and really interestingly talks about developing a relationship with a fae entity. And we discuss how travel thins the veil between worlds. Now, weirdly... There seemed to be kind of a weird occurrence that on several occasions I seemed to know exactly what Mana was going to say. Um, just a strange thing that has never happened before. Um, so listen out for that. In the Plus show we get a little bit more in depth into uh, Mana's relationship with the Fey Entity. We discuss some of her travels in Ireland and some of her astral work. Um, some, some really interesting stuff there and, and a lot to enjoy in the show um, and hopefully I'll be appearing on uh, on the Real Witches of the End Times podcasts uh, soon so um, yeah really looking forward to that if you want to hear the Plus Show then sign up to the Spirit Box Patreon and you'll get the Plus Show along with a host of other benefits to that end if you like the Spirit Box and want to support it there are a number of ways you can do so there's the aforementioned Patreon um, but it's also a PayPal link in every YouTube video and in my link three. As I always say, I'm really interested in hearing people's experiences with the other, from hauntings to shadow people uh, and, and gin and so on. If you have a story to tell, reach out to me. Um, I'd love to hear what you got to say. Okay, let's get on with the show. Mana Aileen, it is a great pleasure to welcome you to the Spirit Box. Thank you for having me. Hey, it's my it's my pleasure. Um, it is episode fifty, so it's you've you've got the momentous um, privilege 
is it a privilege? I don't know. Uh, but you're very welcome. And uh, yeah, it's great to have you on the show for episode 50. And as we were just chatting about um, before we hit record, um, we launched our respective podcasts on the same day, which I think is pretty cool. Yeah, I think it's super funny. I like to consider the fact that my podcast is an Aries with the Leo rising, which would make a lot of sense, but I don't know what time yours was born at, but I'm sure you could also look that up and get a whole birth chart. Yeah, (laughs) I really like that. I actually have to try and do that. So to start with, I suppose what would be good to know is your podcast. uh, I mean, I love the name Real Witches of the End Times. Where where does that name come from? What's the the, the creative concept? (laughs) There is a TV enterprise um, called the Real Housewives of Insert City here. So there's the Real Housewives of Melbourne, Real Housewives of like Atlanta, Georgia, Real Housewives of LA. And I just thought it was funny. And to be honest, I didn't think we would all be I mean, I didn't think I would be doing this podcast long enough for the length of the name to ever become an issue for me. But now it's so long. I love it. So hard to say. (laughs) I love it. That is that is such I love it. That's really, really funny. So what a brilliant concept. Um, I never clocked it. That's brilliant. (laughs) Um, I mean, is that a is that a problem? Do you get a is just a long thing to say in, in the show or? It's not so much in the show that it's a problem. It's like the logistical stuff. So I'm currently working on merch for the podcast and the name is just so big that it's hard to incorporate into a design. And then when I made an Instagram account for the podcast, the name is too long for the name box on Instagram. So I have to put real witches of the end times, which bothers nobody but me. Right. But it does bother me. (laughs) (laughs) I had... um... I did a bit of research before and there's, there was no podcasts called Spirit Box. Uh, there was lots of shows about Spirit Boxes. Uh, but then after I kind of launched my Patreon, what I did find out was there's quite a well-established um, like metal band called Spirit Box. And for like the first two months, like every second Patreon that turned up, uh, would leave. And I checked the exits. You know, do you remember the exit surveys you have in Patreon? And they're all just like, uh, sorry, wrong spirit box, lols. (laughs) Just like all (laughs) all the time, you know. And it was just slightly kind of crushing each time you're going, oh, yeah, great new patron. It's really starting to make it. Oh, no, no, they thought I was someone else again. Yeah, yeah. It's like. You know, what's funny is uh, I have my kind of username on a lot of different platforms has just been Mothmana. And mm-hmm. I really why my Instagram is Mothmana Tarot mm-hmm. is because there's another Mothmana on Instagram who's also an Asian person who's no into like um, cosplay and like fantasy stuff. So I was like, mm-hmm. this might potentially be confusing in the future for other mm-hmm. people. Mm-hmm. But I, I have thought about um, trying to buy the username from them, but I also don't want to do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah it, it does get tricky there's there's not a lot that's uh that's new out there is there it's a kind of every um it used to be every story every story has been told under the sun every story under the sun has been told and now it's like every username under the sun has been taken um but what was i going to mm-hmm. say um really what it, one of the reasons that i, I wanted to ask you on uh on the show uh was similarly kind of to to understand a bit more about your journey given that kind of you and i did the exact same thing on the same day other sides of the world which i thought was really intriguing and it's in the same territory um but kind of you know your overall journey into you know who you are and the areas you explore in your podcast and I wanted to particularly pick up on, on your your artwork you, you really have some some fascinating and uh, really well executed beautiful art um, and I kind of wanted to ask you you know what what came first the the interest in in, in, the, in the paranormal and then kind of exploring the spirit world and then on your own spirituality or the art, or are they 
completely intertwined. Well, what's interesting about that is I've, you know, I'm someone who I was lucky enough to kind of grow up in a house that was a bit of a blank canvas for me to experiment with spiritual concepts. My mom grew up in an extremely Catholic family. And so by the time she reached adulthood, she was like, I just don't care anymore about like religion or anything. And so um, I was able to explore things that came up for me so I could like experiment with things like basic stuff like astrology or um, tarot and all of those things. And it wasn't like a concern for anyone in my house. It was just, oh, like our, our kid is kind of into some odd stuff and it was okay. And so I'm really lucky that I was able to grow up like that. But also that being said, no one in my immediate family was interested in that to the degree I was. And so I started to really struggle with a lot of mental health stuff in high school, which is when I really got into it. And um, I'd had an imaginary friend, or at least what people would consider an imaginary friend when I was in, like from really young, from about, I would say second or third grade until middle school, which is not socially acceptable to have an imaginary friend that long. And when I realized that it became a lot more difficult for me to really be myself in like this world that we're in. And I had very few close friends because that person was my closest friend for a long time, which is something we can come back to because that's kind of a repeating pattern that's happening now. Sure. But with the, with my art, I've always been like an artistic person. So my worst, what's, what's ironic though about that is like my worst physical sense, I would say is my eyesight. I have terrible eyesight. My, I have really strong glasses. And even so like my glasses prescription now is not updated. So I don't see very well in general, but I feel things, hear things and can, um, I see things in like metaphors. And so art has always been an outlet for me when I, I originally wanted to be a comic book illustrator but I went to art school for a little while and really hated it, just the environment and everything, because the way that I produce art is a lot more of just when I'm inspired to do so. And it's hard for me to create it as like a product. So when I, by the time I got to college, I had an interest in the paranormal and the spiritual, and I had a lot of life experiences with that, that really kind of made it a significant part of my life. But I also, when I was my first year of college, started to have this really weird compulsion to draw people during classes. And by compulsion, I literally mean compulsion. It was, I would be in, I remember specifically, there was one time I was in a geography class and I had to draw my professor on my notes. And it was like an itch that had to be scratched. And so it started happening more and more frequently. And it kind of worried me a little bit because there was a time in uh, my sophomore and junior year of high school where I worried that I was developing some type of schizophrenia because I didn't have at all of a community that could um, talk about what I could talk about what I was experiencing with seeing things or um, hearing voices. And if you bring that up to anyone, people wanna help you. And so they think there's something mentally wrong with you. When in reality for me, it was just a really strong psychic sense that was developing really early on that I had absolutely no control over. And it was kind of overrunning my life a little bit. Um, so I was worried this was another manifestation of that because I would look at someone and I would get feelings and see colors in my head. And I, a lot of the symbols and stuff would become metaphors for different things. And it would only kind of be satiated if I would create the concept um, and so I was actually really lucky at that time as well, later on that year to meet someone who was part of another paranormal podcast and they, in a weird turn of events, ended up coming through the small town that I was living in. And then I, well, they interviewed me on their podcast and I put kind of a call out at the end of, I do this weird thing here. I drew a picture of this person. They're going to post it on their Instagram. If anyone else does this please contact me and tell me. And when that episode went up, um, I didn't get anyone that said that they understood what I was doing, but I had so many people reach out wanting me to do that for them. And so that's kind of what started the whole idea of a spirit portrait for someone else intentionally. And they originally started off as watercolor paintings. 
and that's what they were for a couple of years. And this is like my fifth year of doing them now. And because of the pandemic, I've switched to a digital format, which I actually like a lot better. And they are a lot more clear of what I see and what I feel because someone will talk to me and their voice will have a shape in my head. And then I'll want to put those shapes in the art. So I don't know if, I, if you've ever experienced, experienced this, Dara, but some words like sound sharp. Like there was an experiment that I we had to do in, I remember like in sixth grade in grade school where you had to, there was like two words, lolly and varnak. And they have in my head, very distinct shapes. Like varnak is super sharp. Lolly is really round, but that is what everything sounds like to me. So there's all sorts of sounds and people's voices that have a shape or elemental representations or um, just things that pop into my head. Sometimes I'll put sigils in there too. Wow. And that's kind of where I'm at now. It's a continually evolving process that's kind of grown with my interests in different things. And it's only expanded even further now that I'm learning so much more about different occult traditions or spiritual practices. And it kind mm -hmm. of just creates a large encyclopedia for me to create things with. I mean, it's it's stunning work, you know, first and foremost, be, before you even take me through the the, the process that you go through and, and to create these pieces, it, it's just, it's, it's really lovely work, you know, um, and the images are stunning. They're really beautiful. Um, and really engaging they really draw you in there's so much going on in them um and um, uh, the thing that really jumped out for me when i first saw your work was they kind of reminded me of like astral photography that kind of you know that kind of shimmery hazy quality to you get to kirillin photography where whether you the user going to big, big Kirlin cameras to take a photograph of your energy field. It's got a quality of that in it as well, but 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 it has its own unique style. It's really, really, really interesting stuff. But to hear your creative process, my God, that's so incredible. You know, that you're you're getting these sensations from people and you're visualizing them. Um, I mean, it sounds really just shamanic and 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 um what was I gonna say as well that when you were when you were talking earlier, um, I had a, a thought pop into my head, um, which was, ah, yes, around the whole thing of creativity, you know, and, and I've spoken about this before um, to two other people that it, that it, that it experienced stuff, the, the way you're describing it, the way I've described it as well, it, is having that creative streak is often tied with um one spirituality or certainly spirituality that is 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 totally uh, away from convention that is is totally explorative um and, and expansive that has a whole pantheon that has a vibrant living multiple multi-dimensional reality to it and it's really interesting to hear about you talking about having this imaginary friend for a long time and that in a way that set you apart from your school peer group. But at the same time, you had this real compulsion to create. And I wanted to ask, do you think those two things are, are, are intertwined? You know? Well, I'm not an only child. I have twin siblings who are 10 years younger than me but because of that a lot of my family's focus once they were born was on them which is like makes sense and it was totally fine like I grew up in a, in a great environment but because of that I had to really kind of develop my own world like I lived out in the woods I didn't have neighbors the same way that a lot of people do and everything was pretty much in my own head like the main thing that that imaginary friend and I would do was we would imagine at least imagine quote unquote that we were in this like spy boarding school so all i was doing was creating this whole story with them whenever we would hang out and to me they were my little sister named kate and like the bathtub or like taking a shower would be like we're in a spaceship traveling somewhere or the car would be an airplane and then we were constantly in battle with this other boarding school um, that was like trying to sabotage ours. And so it was all these different adventures and things. So in a way, yeah, it was definitely connected to creativity. I built an entire world with them. And then as I moved, well, I moved a lot 
too, as a kid. So I've lived in, I've lived in so many different places as well in my adult life so far. And every place we would move would just become another part of that world that I was building. And so I do think that it is connected to the creative process. But what is interesting too, is I don't know if it's necessarily create connected to the portrait, but I, I still don't really know where those came from either. It was just a very sudden thing that was happening in 2016 that I haven't been able to stop since. That's it's it's really interesting stuff. Really interesting. I'm I'm looking at your your artwork now, and um, yeah, there, there's there's so much going on. And it's really interesting. Um, yeah, those are only just some of them. There's so yeah. many more <laughs> that aren't on there. <laughs> um i just realized that i ended both my my initial questions with uh with, with you with the word intertwined so i'll try and stop saying intertwined for the rest of the show <laughs> or kind of my listeners gritting their teeth with my uh meandering waffling um it, it's so take me through your your, your imaginary friend so is your imaginary friend is 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 Kate and stayed with you for a long time and uh, was the creation of, of these stories and worlds was, was it a was it a discourse um did, did Kate feel separate to you or, or feel like a part of you how did it how did, how did it what did it feel like so I don't really remember when she appeared, but I do know what house I was living in at the time, which was a house um, that I ended up, like we, my family ended up experiencing being foreclosed. Uh, I, but, I, but I ended up meeting her before my other sisters were even born. And it was just like someone to play with, like the way that you would have friends over at your house to play a game or something, that's what it was. So we would play dolls together or we would again, build this world. So we would go on like spy missions and they would be again, like my little sister. So I was responsible for them in a way. So I would say they felt separate from me. Mm -hmm. And I don't remember when they, they, I started calling her Kate. I have, I don't remember that either, but I do remember one time I was, <laughs> there was an air mattress that was blown up in the house and I had taken it and put it sideways in the guest bedroom so I could slide down it off the bed like a slide. And my mom came in and was like, what are you doing? I said, oh, I'm playing with my imaginary friend, Kate. And then she's kind of looked at me and then just walked back out into the living room. Mm -hmm. So my parents knew mm -hmm. as well that there was something like that going on. Mm -hmm. But in hindsight, when I've thought about it more in like the years since, my first thought was, okay, like, was that a ghost or a spirit that lived in that house? And that would be something that I would consider more if it had stopped when I moved away from that house, but it didn't. We lived in two other houses after I first met her and she was with me the whole time. And it was never invasive or um, pushy or anything like that. It was always just when I wanted to play, she would appear, which is again, similar to now with a different being. Yeah, um, and if you're comfortable with that, could we go into that the kind of the 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 modern version of that or the the current version of that rather that you're you're experiencing um yeah yeah is that okay so so set the scene give us the background of what happened and 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 what's happening currently so in 2018 i ended up moving to england for a year abroad for uni and or university i i started changing all my words around ever since i lived there because i know people get confused <laughs> <laughs> um but i moved there i moved to bristol which is for those of you who don't know it's about an hour and a half bus ride from glastonbury which ended up being a weird synchronicity for now for some of the people that i'm friends with and I went there and I chose that school with pretty much absolutely no research done, which is how I move a lot. Actually, I kind of just feel like I need to be somewhere and I just go. And that was one of the only schools that was offering my uh, course and was accepted through my school without 
any like financial difference. So I, my, I majored in philosophy in college and I could go there or I could go somewhere up north that was this really small town. And that was just not what I wanted because I grew yeah. up in a small town. My college was in a small town. Didn't want to do that again. So I show up in Bristol and to my amazing like surprise and everything it's like a circus city full of art and things like that and I'm an aerialist so that was so wild that I chose the one city that is like infamous internationally for its circus programs and it has a whole uh, bachelor's degree program in circus arts if you wanted to get it it's the only place I know that you can do that and I was amazed and so I lived in a really great flat I got really lucky with all my flatmates that I was assigned um, I was a lot older than them though, which mm -hmm. was kind of weird at first, but it ended up being okay. And the first couple of months kind of, you know, spent time going to school. And I would say this is a time where I, some people would call like falling asleep. So I'd been really into spiritual concepts really heavily for a couple of years. Um, but I, I'd stopped kind of really putting a lot of focus on it in my life and was, you know, focusing on the fact that I had moved to a different country and I had other things going on. And so I wasn't in like a meditative practice anymore. I wasn't like practicing anything really that was helpful for any sense of my intentional spiritual growth. Although there was tons of stuff I was doing and didn't realize it. And because I didn't have a lot of friends in the UK at this point, just mostly acquaintances that I was getting to know, I would go on a lot of solo travels by myself. And so there was one day where I decided to go to Glastonbury because I read online all this really fun stuff about uh, Avalon and everything that I didn't know was, I didn't know like the top of the portal to Avalon or the portal of Avalon was at the top of the tour, hour and a half bus ride from where I was living. I thought that was so cool. So I went and I had an amazing experience out there for a couple of days. I ended up going out to Tintagel in Cornwall as well and just felt amazing and my flatmates had no idea where I went I didn't even tell them that I'd left and when I come home I walked through the door into the kitchen and it was seriously just a chorus of people telling me that I was glowing oh my god you're glowing I don't know what it is but you're glowing and I looked like my normal self if anything I looked travel haggard and it occurred to me then that I'd been spending two days of my life just um, in Glastonbury before going to Cornwall, but just laying in the grassy fields and then being around like the chalice well, like all of those things. Like, okay, I picked up some type of residual something that is strong enough for all these people that are not into these concepts just to have an immediate reaction to me around, which to this day is still mind blowing. And after that, I winter came around, I visited my family for Christmas time, and then I returned back to England for basically the next eight months. And the first couple of weeks back, it was just exams. And I again, again, had a lot more time to myself. And something that I had been doing at this time period was listening to an audiobook. It was like a fantasy, young adult fantasy novel series. I really love books. I'm always in the middle of something um, that I just would listen to as I would go to sleep or as I would walk around because it took forever to walk everywhere because this is the first time in my life that I really didn't have my own way of transportation either. So I was doing that and I had really no genuine interest in the Fae at this point in my life. I knew what they were. I already knew that they weren't like little tiny Victorian winged beings or anything like that. I'd read enough about them in like paranormal stuff or like, and that's like actual that I knew that they weren't like tiny little harmless bugs, which is what a lot of literature in Victorian era made it seem like. And the series was interesting to me though, because it created like an archetype in my head of this type of person in my life that I wanted around. And what I started doing was just like, it was kind of almost, I don't know, just completely like, it was like, the whole Veruca Salt thing from Willy Wonka. It's like, I want a new Balumpa and I want it now. And I was kind of like, I want a Fae warrior and I want it now. But I meant fully when I would say this to myself as a joke or whatever in my head all the time, I meant it as an archetype of a person. So what I was looking for was just people in my life that were extremely loyal, um, would like have my back in situations, 
I would feel comfortable around and safe. Mm. All of these things that I was, that's what I literally meant. I was not looking to connect with the Fae or anything like that or the good folk. And what happened not long after I started doing that was I was sitting in my room, in my flat. I don't remember if I was laying down, if I was trying to fall asleep, but I was, I ended up in that hypnogogic state in between wakefulness and being asleep. Again, whether or not that was intentional, I don't know. And there was just this shadow in my field of vision that stepped out from around the corner and looked at me and I opened my eyes and immediately it was, there was this clear knowing that I just knew what I'd done. <laughs> and I was like, oh, that is a fey being. And I just summoned them into my life. I was very loud about it. And this is not what I meant to do, but it's happened. And so I was immediately very wary. I was like, okay, did I just create a huge problem for myself? Mm -hmm. Why did this happen? Again, it was not like, oh, yay. Like, let me just start like engaging with this, per this being um, or anything like that. It was, I was very cautious. Um, if anything, I think what's funny is I went through an entire experience and I was even younger than this of like extreme, like atheism as well mm -hmm. before all this stuff. So I'm still an extremely skeptical person from, from that time in my life. And so there was part of me too, that recognized, like, if I had had that clear feeling, knowing that I am a very skeptical person, there was something significant about that. So the next couple of months went by and during this time period as well, this was January of 2019. Uh, at the end of February, I got so sick. I got sick enough that um, in retrospect now, it was a near-death experience. Wow. And this happened about a month and a half after I met this being. And, but during that time, they were very respectful of me. I was like, I don't want to engage with you. And they were like, okay, cool. There was like, there was no pressure about it. It didn't occupy a lot of like my time in my head at that point mm -hmm. um, or anything like that. This is actually when I went to visit Prague at the end of January, which you saw in the mm -hmm. picture on my Zoom account, or you're looking at right now. Yes. Um, there wasn't anything <laughs> really concerning about it. I'm a very like energetically sensitive person. I dealt with really awful shit like in my space before. And I just, again, it wasn't something that I was concerned about at all. Um, other than like, I don't want to like do something and create something that I didn't mean to. Mm -hmm. And so I get really sick, it takes me about a month to recover. Right after I recover from that, I start getting incredibly into martial arts, like, but not like uh, karate, but Krav Maga, which oh, is I gotta stop like you. an Israeli. <laughs> I've got to stop you because I knew you were going to say Krav Maga. I totally knew you were going to say Krav Maga. I don't know <laughs> why, but um, there's so many weird similarities between you and I, man. It's 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 got I lived in Bristol for years and like uh, I, I know you know, really really well um that's why I didn't want to interrupt you when you were talking but I know Bristol really really well and just for some reason I knew you were going to say Krav Maga <laughs> then as well because uh, <laughs> I used to do Krav Maga I used to do loads of Krav Maga in Bristol as well um anyway I don't know um right wow. I, sorry I, I I broke your line of thought but um yeah I just no you know that's great <laughs> I'm that I think that actually is relevant to mm -hmm. a lot of this and yeah in the way like i mean i listened to the other pieces of your podcast too about the gin and everything so um i think it's interesting yeah and well i'm reflecting on that as well because i went to the other side of the world um you know essentially for work and and came back with a different way of seeing the world and similarly you went to the other side of the world for education and exploring and you know something comparative happened to you as well I mean but anyway I'm interrupting you and I will stop so <laughs> back to you so um I got really into martial arts or Krav Maga like to the point where it occupied like all of my free time and it became like a personality trait of something that I had to do and I fully recognized that this book series that I'd read had also completely inspired me to become that like fey warrior that I wanted in my life. And I didn't think that was relevant to any of like the, the near death experience, meeting this being, anything up until recently. 
Um, all like this past, like the entirety of 2019 and 2020 didn't really come into focus for me until like the past couple of weeks. So like the time that you're doing this interview is perfect because I hadn't weaved everything together yet. And it's still kind of blowing my mind. So I'm out in this land, I'm doing that. And I start to kind of invite this being a little bit closer in. Um, I would just I'd start to ask questions or um, I just recognize that when I would like walk around at night, like again, like I refer to this time as when I was really asleep. So I was drinking a lot, um, which is not a thing for me. And nowadays it's still not, it was just a very small window of my life. I was just drunk a lot, partying a lot. Um, I lived cool. down the street in Bristol from like Thecla and like, uh, I'm forgetting other club names. I lived like two blocks away from like four different clubs. So it was happening. Uh, and there's a no, jazz bar, there's, like, I could see no my window. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no choice. Um, and it was great. I had a great time doing that. I'm glad I did it. I didn't have like bad experiences with it. Um, I was lucky. And yeah, but I would just recognize that they would just be around. It was just this energy that I just knew was them. Um, and it was kind of like a, standing sentry type of thing like a like a personal like bodyguard that was around and that was what i got from it which i thought was weird because if this being is fey and there's some sense of, like I, I from what i read it's like why would they do this what is their what are they getting out of this you know um i didn't really understand and again um i was very questioning of it but i just would let them do that and would welcome it at some at a certain point. I was like, all right, this is fine. And then I would just start kind of like going for walks around the city and they would just be right there, right next to me. And it slowly became more of like a, just recognizing their energy around. And I started to develop a, like a board of images on Pinterest of just things that reminded me of them because I couldn't get a full picture of them in my head. My brain like couldn't process it. So I started doing the same thing I do with spirit portraits, which is just think of like things that remind me of the being, what does their voice sound like? What is the shape of the way they talk? Um, are there any songs I can think of? All these different things. So I started putting an entire board together um, of this being. And the main thing that I had taken away from it is that they look like autumn, like fall trees, like those orange and reds and colors but they feel like they're from the ocean. And so I had like these webbed ears, um, all of these things like that. And they also had like a bow and arrow and they were definitely coming to me in a way I would understand for sure. I'm aware that they don't literally look like that, but that's like the way I was perceiving it. Um, and they also, I, I couldn't see like their face, which was important for later on that year when I did start to see it. But that was the main, sense of image that I got and it was this really deep sense of like connection of not just um okay like it's, it's it's not just like oh like we're like you wanted me to come hang out you're yelling about a fey warrior I heard you I'm here it was a lot more of cool finally you're finally remembering um now I'm here and so it's like they knew me but I didn't like really fully know them yet and I started reading too, like, uh, and, and I learned later on more about like the Leonan Shi, and I got really scared. So I was like, "What the fuck? Like, this cannot. Like, I don't want this to be that." Uh, and because I was like worried about, okay, is this like a vampiric situation or all of those different things? And the main pieces of that, while I'm kind of framework, this kind of could sound like that situation. The actual details of it are extremely different, and I don't feel like that's what's going on. Right. Um, again, I could be wrong. I don't know, but for now it's fine. And it just kind of kept developing. And then I ended up in, when school was done, uh, I ended up going to work at a hostel in the Grand Canaria for a chunk of the summer before I had to move back to California. And when I did that, they went with me, it was chill. And I ended up having a really bizarre experience with like premonition and vision of um, meeting this person uh, out on this island uh, and they like I had like a really significant really short-lived relationship with them and um, and I left yeah and during that whole time this being completely stepped back they didn't like intervene 
I read some things like about the Leonan Shi where like being in a relationship with another person would be like problematic or the person, yeah, the human bad. involved wouldn't even seek that out mm -hmm. anymore. Yeah, that was not the experience at all. It was very like distance and respectful, but they were still around if I wanted to talk. It was like never, there was no sense of like um, imposing on the situation. It was actually extremely significant, um, emotionally great experience in my life up until when I went home and I basically realized that I had had a premonition about pregnancy and then it totally came true. No way. And I was put in this really awkward situation of having to temporarily live with my family until I got back on my feet while having the burden of knowing that I'm pregnant right. with someone's kid who lives on a remote island, uh, basically in the middle of nowhere uh, <laughs> and dealing with all of that alone. And there was, I could talk to some of my friends about it, but there was not a spiritual layer that they were really open to at this point. And so it sounded, I'm sure if they ever hear this, they'll probably be kind of surprised about how distressing it actually was for me. Um, and this is like the first time I ever heard them talk, this being that I'd met. Um, I was sitting on a swing set at my family's house and having to like, I had simultaneously picked out um, a potential names for this baby or days that I could go get an abortion. Mm -hmm. And I was just upset. <laughs> and they basically sat on the other swing next to me and just looked at me and were like, I love you. You're fine. Everything's going to be okay. This is totally fine. It's going to be fine no matter what. And it was just everything that I needed to hear. Um, in that moment that I wasn't getting from any people, like literal people in my life. And there was just this sense that, um, cause I get like emotions with words. So it was also like, they were not supposed to be there. They were breaking the rules. And I don't know what these rules are but they are apparently breaking the rules. Um, and that was when like I started to feel like there was this glass wall between me and another person. And that's also when I started to question, okay, is this a fae being or is this someone else's like higher self? I don't know what's going on. There's like something about that though. And that kind of just added a lot of like confusion to what was happening, but also like, again, like a huge sense of peace and security. I ended up uh, miscarrying and then um, there was a huge pain with like that relationship with the actual person from the island that I had to deal with for the next couple of months. But ultimately all of that really pushed me really deep into spirituality where I'm at now. So it was all in all, like to me, I'm glad that I was able to move through that experience in the way that I did. But after that, my relationship with this being just kept becoming more and more close and more conversational and a lot more like I could just talk to them if wow. I wanted to. And I ended up working with a shaman for the month of October leading up to Samhain. Um, we, I was doing like an ancestral meditation series and they ended up teaching me about how you could journey to places and that she just recommends that you take, if you have some type of being that you're close to an ancestor or something to take with you to help you vet through whatever comes your way as like a safety measure. And I was like, oh, I'll just take this being. And so that's when we started to develop like this partner, like this kind of like battle partner dynamic as well. So I started to be able to travel to all these different places I never thought I could because I didn't have backup before. And now I had like this warrior with me that could help me like navigate some really difficult astral terrain that I never would have dared go to before. Um, and I will not go to without this person still. And it was really great. Cause again, it wasn't like, um, it wasn't concerning to me at that still at that point it wasn't and it's still not to this day but uh, it just we started to develop that type of relationship and then uh, this shaman was like well have you asked their name and I was like oh that's a great question no I didn't and so I meditated on it and I just asked and I was like hey what's your name and they told me one name that was a name um it was like weirdly the one of the names that I was gonna potentially choose for the baby 
So I was like, no, like, that's not, that's not your name. And then they told me another name and I was like, no, that's not it. And then I just, in my head, mixed those two names together into com- what I thought was complete gibberish. And I was like, all right, sure. That's your name, which I'm not going to say on the podcast, but yeah. Um, I ended up telling my shaman that and she was like, well, did you Google it? And I was like, oh, these are all great points that I'm not thinking <laughs> of for some reason. So I Googled it <laughs> and it's Gaelic literal Gaelic verbatim spelling no way for oath or promise wow yeah we love yeah that. and we love I was blown away <laughs> mm-hmm. I'll, I'll tell you after yeah, yeah I just yeah, don't yeah, want yeah. it on yeah, no, for course, an no, indefinite no. amount of people yeah um and that blew my mind because that word that it the words that this name meant was exactly the type of relationship that it felt like it felt like we had some type of oath to each other that was completely like trans-dimensional um that has existed for a long time and like the way I describe it now it's like I feel like no matter what if people are into reincarnation or whatever or um I think everything exists at once so throughout whatever timelines or threads of fate I'm on are this beings on like we're able to, it's kind of like a tracking thing almost like we can just find each other um and again i don't know all these things for sure but this is just like the feeling that i have at this point so sure. we continued to develop i started to like get more comfortable with them and then they started to show me more of them that i would not have been able to handle like a year before so like there was like features that were like a lot more like conventionally quote unquote scary that are like, to me fine now just like um like as an example of one of them he has like super piercing blue eyes that are like flashlights coming out of his head uh that it's just the super bright blue it's like it's in my head I can just see it but uh if if I had seen that it it was like the same equivalent of like glowing red eyes but just blue um and if I'd seen that right right away I'd be like get get away from me I don't know what's happening um this is scary and inhuman (laughs) um but yeah so like a lot of things like that and I've kind of added those to the Pinterest board too. One day I'm going to draw him, but I just haven't gotten to a point where I think I'm ready to do that yet or I have enough information. And um, I just kept feeling like I, I was scared to tell people, like I told that shaman, but that was the only person I told because again, at this point, my knowledge of um, the Bay or the good folk was very minimal um, in terms of like, the capacity of what was happening. So I had not, nothing that I was reading matched that situation other than um, this is about when I start, like about when I got, was looking more into like wondering if this was like a Leon on she situation. Yeah. Um, I don't know if I placed that right earlier, but this was about when, because my shaman was like, oh, there's this total thing like about like spirit lovers and like a lot of different cultures. You might want to look into that. And so I started to, and I, cause I got scared, it's like, oh shit but it doesn't feel like that in the same way that they describe it. Yeah. Um, and what was weird is I did like a, a session with her and this is someone that I, I do trust and wasn't like, is like a real, real deal shaman, not like an Instagram shaman. And they could see him. I've never heard that term before. Uh, that was, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, but they could see him. And to this day now, it's been about two years since I met them. I've, I, I was counting it before we started recording. There's, I've had six people in my life that have interacted with them in ways that they shouldn't have been able to. Wow. Um, which is so odd. Um, between people like having conversations, I have like repeat things and reading sometimes where people who have no idea who I am are like, oh, who's like, and they'll like describe him. And I was like, oh, I know who that is. Um, or just other things pop up. And there was even like a brief period of time where someone like showed up in my life that was like so similar to them, it was freaky. And then I was again wondering, okay, is like this, this person, this, this weird, again, Leon on she thing, am I gonna get like taken off into the woods? Um, and it wasn't, it was just more of, like, I feel like a Venn diagram. Like sometimes I think there's like a Venn diagram of, like these spirit beings that we meet and then people that we know in real life and they overlap sometimes. So the person's not like fully that, but there's pieces of them that are connected to it. So there was someone I was in a relationship with for a while, um, like a couple months 
at the beginning of 2020 that had a lot of things that were so eerily similar to this being that it was kind of weird. And I even told them about it. Like I, I'd straight up told them, oh, I had this whole weird relationship with this being and you kind of remind me of them. And I showed them the board and even they were like, oh, this is really weird. This is really odd. Like there's so many similarities here. Um, and it wasn't like freaky to them, um, which was odd too. <laughs> like, I'm glad you're into that, I guess. But yeah, so continue to now. Um, it's just kind of been a developing thing. They're around and, oh, this is the one thing I forgot to say. This is why I mentioned the martial arts thing earlier. I know I'm giving you so much information right now, but okay. I did, a, <laughs> I went on a journey in November of 2019 that um, it was just, again, it was like a practicing journey session, journey group. It wasn't the intentionally ancestral one. Like it was in October. It was just like practicing, moving around, um, in other places. And I don't even think we had a prompt. It was just go back to your place where, you know, you can start from in your mind, which, which like I use a river personally in my head. And, um, I ended up like in this place. I was surround, suddenly surrounded by birds and um, this person, this other being appeared. And again, my potentially fey being was with me and this other person appeared with all these birds around. And just for a forewarning, um, I know now if you're in a journey situation or a vision and something gives you something, don't take it with you out of the session. Uh, just for anyone doing that now, but I didn't know this at the time. So I did take this, but uh, they gave me a sword that had a very specific symbol carved onto it. And then they looked over at the being that was with me, acknowledged them and gave them a dagger with the same symbol. And that to me, when that happened and then we left, um, I had no idea who that was at the time or anything or who they possibly could have been. I just thought it was really significant that they acknowledged who was with me and gave them something too. And that's another thing as well that kind of kicked the idea of the Leon on she out a little bit more because I feel like that probably wouldn't have happened um, at the time. And I left that and I told the person who was leading the session and they looked at me kind of like a little odd. They're like, oh, I think that was potentially this goddess. And I knew about that goddess, but I didn't know a lot of information. And so I had to do a lot of research. And then I kind of forgot about it up until recently. Um, and when I started thinking more about my, uh, my experiences earlier that year um, with like a sudden extreme interest in like martial arts and combat and fighting and um, this whole warrior stuff and like death and like all of these things that really become a part of my life that led up right. to that moment. And as well with that symbol that was on those, both of those blades, when I was in Ireland in April of 2019, um, I really wanted a necklace that had this symbol because I loved the symbol for a long time. And I did not, not want it from like a kitschy gift shop. Like I just wanted something that had more significance to it. And I was wandering all around with my friend, uh, my, my real person friend, not the <laughs> baby, but uh, <laughs> around like we were in, oh my gosh. I'm totally Galway. forgetting the name now. We were, we were in Galway. Yeah, you knew. Uh, yeah. We were wandering around the Galway. The thing I knew and, you were going to say, um, Really weird. <laughs> I was wandering around Galway and every single shop has like 500 of these necklaces. They were like super cheap and everything. And it's just not the energy exchange that I wanted to have. And we ended up on like a tour bus out of to like, we're on a tour day tour for like the Cliffs of Mower, but I chose one that has stopped like out in like all the peatlands and everything yeah. um, and just different places. And there was like this little, we're in the middle of nowhere. There's this little stone uh, formation going on, which I forget what that's called at the time now, but, oh, um, again, like I had been 10. Yes. Uh, and I had forgot again, like I wanted this necklace. I'd almost bought it a lot of times, but I decided, no, like this is the practice of manifestation. I'm going to keep denying these weird these things that I don't want. I'm not going to just accept the first thing. And we go out there and just in the middle of nowhere, there's just this dude 
on the side of the road in like with a table full of necklaces that he's hand putting together oh, cool. that are of these symbol. <laughs> yeah. And so of course that's the one I have and I'm actually wearing it right now, but um, which you can't see right currently because we have the cameras off, but I'll show you later. Is it? But um, yeah, that was. <laughs> is it the triple circle, the intertwined circles? Yeah. Oh, did I not say that? Sorry, I didn't mean to make that sound secretive. I did that on accident. <laughs> no, no worries, no worries. From Newgrange, from the, the, the Keystone and Newgrange. I'll show you afterwards. You, you, I'm not sure. Okay. Like three spirals. It's the triple spirals. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah. 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 Sorry, I'm interrupting you again. Um, you went down to the Cliffs of Mohair. You got the, the, the symbol. Um, and... and in terms of being in Ireland, I mean, did, did, did things intensify there or did you have any other experiences while you were there? Yeah, I, I totally did. It was just like everything was so much more vivid. I've never, like I had, I was really, I had a really rough winter that earlier winter right. before because I got so sick um, and I had a month of basically being in the literal darkness of my room mm. um, as well as like, dying like all this type of stuff that just really made it hard to want to live life uh and when I came out of that I just lived completely differently and I had a whole new focus and so when I went to Ireland I remember standing on the edge of the cliffs of mower uh and of course like so many people feel like this in extreme significance there because it is such an amazing beautiful place that also a lot of people fall off of and die yes <laughs> <laughs> But <laughs> that. it's a terrible thing to happen to I anybody. looked up <laughs> um I looked up an astrocartography which is the astrology of place and you have these lines with that and after this whole experience um that summer like in the fall I looked it up and I have a line that goes right along the edge of the cliffs of mower and then right down through the Grand Canaria wow it's the same one Wow. which was really weird, which I don't really understand astrocartography, but that is like kind of an odd anomaly in terms mm. of lines or I don't know. Because again, the Grand Canary is this tiny island chain in the middle of nowhere mm. and it went right through it. Same one as the Cliffs of Mower. But yeah, I had I really loved it there. It's one of my favorite places I've ever been um, in Ireland and I've been a lot of places now and it's one that I think of very fondly of. Um, and it's really connected to now knowing the the goddess that I ended up potentially connecting with um, unknowingly at the time and uh, just all all this stuff around uh, things that I didn't know were going to happen to me basically the rest of that year so yeah now this being is like interacts with other people that I know um, they're kind of like just a part of my group with where I live. Like they just, it's just another being that lives in the house sometimes. Right. And what's, I, the only time I've had like a situation where I, I recognize like the amount of power that, that this being could potentially have. Mm -hmm. um, I, earlier in the, like this past summer, so fast forward to 2020, um, there was a situation where I had had my like physical boundaries really violated by someone that I trusted mm -hmm. and they were kind of living in the same space as me for a small period of time. And they knew this being existed. Um, and I went to bed one night and this person was like in another bed, a few feet away from me. This was a couple of days after they really like hurt me. And mm -hmm. I didn't even recognize that I'd been like had like an act of like violence done against me right. uh, at that point because I was in such like strong denial about it mm -hmm. and like wanted to blame myself but this person this human woke up abruptly in the morning and was acting really weird this was like two days later um and I was like what's going on or like oh did you have any weird dreams and I said no not that I'm aware of and they said that they woke up because they were in again that in-between state of like dreaming and wakefulness um, where they had a sense of like their physical body, but there was just this being standing on the bed completely over them who took a blade and cut open their entire body um, in their sleep. And then what he woke up feeling like he was gonna wet the bed. 
Wow. And my first thought was like, oh, okay. I don't know why this, my, my being would do that, but it feels like that's something, this feels like he did that. And then I kind of pushed it away. I was like, no, that's kind of weird for me to think that. Mm -hmm. And then um, the person in the room was like, was it, was it them? And then the fact that they had that thought too, was like, their first thought was like, okay. Right. The um, book landed in that space then. I think that happened. Right. <laughs> yeah. And so um, I really, per, like I, th that kind of goes back to the oath thing. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know. I, again, I have no idea what's actually going on. I have not been led to believe at this point that I am in any like particular situation, but it's funny. Cause like, even before I knew a ton more about um, the good folk or everything, I fully would differentiate them from like my spirit team. So some people like use phrases like, Oh, I have my spirit team or guides mm -hmm. um, depending on who you're talking to. Just like some people just refer to like, they have one being they talk to as their HGA or their Holy guardian angel. It's something along those lines. It's like this kind of counsel that people have to talk about things. And I've always differentiated that this being is not one of my guides. They're not like, they're sure they're part of my spirit team, but they're here because they want to be. And it's like a, it's that's why um I, and then I, someday we'll probably part ways yeah I, I know where you're going with that it's like it's a different relationship and but it's it's an important one but it's not it's not a it's not a kind of parental one like you get with spirit guides you know where there is that little kind of hierarchy and like you know with the, the hea as well it doesn't have that kind of <clears throat> guiding way it's like it's it's a, it's a, a much more kind of a a lateral relationship like you're there's something in it for both of you yeah so thank you for sharing some some, some incredible stories there man I, I really appreciate it um it's been a real real pleasure to to have you on the show i, I really appreciate it um it's I, I gotta be honest it's been one of the weirder shows because there was that was a few times i knew what you were going to say we'll pick it up afterwards there's um i think we're yeah. tapping into some sort of similar current <laughs> there's something going on but uh <laughs> um, but what was i going to say where's the best place for people to to uh to to, to find your work and, and um, the show i'll obviously put it all in the, in the show notes so the best place to go would be mothmana.com. There I have links to my Instagram, which is mothmana tarot. But I also have there just information on um, the other types of readings that I do in addition to spirit portraits. And I am offering other readings right now. Uh, but I also have a full gallery of some of my favorite spirit portraits on my website. So you can find that there if you mm -hmm. want to have a visual representation of what Dara and I have been talking about. And I also have a Patreon which is patreon.com slash mothmana. Oh, and my podcast. So that too, the real witches of the end times. All of those things are linked on my website um, if, if you're curious. And um, I'm sure uh, I'll, after this recording, I'm going to convince Dara to come on my podcast. So oh, have absolutely. To come listen there for that one. Um, I mean, you've got the best podcast name out there as far as I'm concerned. I'll be delighted to um, for a start. Um, <laughs> Well, again, thank you so much. I really, really appreciate your time. It's been fantastic talking to you. And um, yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, man. I really appreciate you coming on the Spirit Box. Um, really interesting stuff and some incredible experiences. So thanks again for sharing them with the Spirit Box audience. Um, right, that's it from me. Do check out Mana's links in the show notes. And um, I'll wrap it up there. Bye.